Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Taylor Tuesday. This is our last one of the year, and I have to tell you that um, it's a it's a complete honor to have um, our speaker that we have tonight, uh, Lowell Weil. Uh, over the last few years, he and I have gotten a chance to become uh, friendlier and, and, and have worked together and done things. And, um, and then, of course, I have Mike King, who has been my um, hardcore partner throughout this and, and, and taken most of almost every Tuesday we've uh, every other Tuesday we've done this together and, and it's it's it started out as something to um, help our profession when COVID hit and to talk about ideas to help you come out of COVID. It's morphed into doing things that are you know better for your practice. I think one of the things about Taylor and you know it's actually interesting because um, uh, both uh, Dr. King and Doc and Dr. Weil are, are directors at Taylor and part of the whole premise of Taylor was not just the best price but education, how we can teach you how to do things better and um, we've really prided ourselves on doing that. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to my esteemed colleague Dr. Mike King and let him go through um, a few things and, and then we're going to, I'm looking really forward to hearing, uh, Lowell, I'm, I'm ending the year on a bang and I'm really excited about having you. So Mike. Awesome. So welcome everybody to Taylor Tuesday again. And of course, to our guest Lowell Weil, um, it's great to have the legacy that you bring and the, and the reputation is, is really wonderful. And, uh, the things that you've done for our profession are great. So we're grateful, but we're thrilled to have you here and everybody, who joins us? You know, we we always open up with talking a little bit about uh, Taylor Medical and making sure that if you're a novice about Taylor, please uh, remember that you should go to the website taylormedical.com, and uh, you are actually able to uh, check back and look at any of our old webinars as well as uh, reviewing tonight's again. Because I know that Dr. Weil has some really great pointers in here about you know strengthening your practice, so you'll be able to. And I was flipping me all over the place here, um, where. Ira, you're flipping me off and you don't even know it. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, but, but we want to make sure that you go to taylormedical.com so you can take a look at any of the past webinars. And uh, I think, you know, as, as Ira alluded to, we're trying to to change a little bit of the paradigm. It isn't, we're not just about selling products. We're about making your practice better. And I think that's what tonight's guest is really going to offer for us too. So make sure I hit the right button here, guys. Sorry. So remember that if you haven't taken the time to do this, it's the end of the year. Uh, you want to start to build and getting your platforms ready for next year. And one of the best ways to do that is to become part of Taylor Medical if you're not already. And if you are a member, thank you. But uh, make sure that you take the time to let Carla and her team uh, take a look at, at your data so you can send us a list. And Excel is the best way, but we'll take it however we can get it uh, to help you save some money in your practice. And so send us a list with your vendors' names, your items that you want to buy, uh, let us do some price comparisons for you. Uh, any information you give us about the product is better uh, because we're guaranteeing that you can save some money for your practice. And uh, we have seen some incredible metrics um, and uh, has been extremely helpful. And I know I've mentioned this before, but I know that uh, both the company I work for, Upper Line Healthcare and, and uh, uh, Extremity Health uh, that Ira works for, we're both on the on the platform through Taylor now, which has just been a tremendous benefit for us. So uh, we encourage you to please send your data and and get involved. So uh, we're very fortunate. Ira, I'll let you do the final uh, recognition and introduction here of our fine guest, and I'll step aside until we're done. As, as, as I mentioned earlier, we are really, really excited to have Lowell Weil. Um, uh, he has been a, a, a leader in our profession, uh, and not only not only academically, but um, educationally and trying to help your practices do better. So without that, without any further ado, Lowell, I'm going to turn it over to you and Mike and I'll be waiting and we'll ask you some questions if we get any at the end. Great. Thanks, Ira. Uh, and thanks, Mike. Can you uh, put my, my picture up on the right-hand corner? Because I've got slides kind of to the left. Ira. Yeah, thanks. That's great. Um, before we get started, um, Ira and Mike, thanks for having me today. And when Ira and Jeff DeSantis approached me several years ago about the concept of Taylor Medical and what they wanted to do, and ultimately it came down to they just want to help at I treat. And they have, you know, Ira and Mike and Jeff have a legacy of helping podiatry. And whether it was helping uh, podiatrists procure products that were effective for patient care in a less expensive way, or now through education, I think Taylor really provides an amazing 
resource uh, to podiatrists. Uh, and I, I think if you're not involved with Taylor, I'd encourage you to do so. And the Waffle and Ankle Institute uses Taylor on a lot of different levels. Uh, and it's helped us with our pricing and, our, and reducing our overhead so that we can continue to provide great patient care, uh, but do it in, in ways that still give our doctors an opportunity to make the best living they possibly can. When I, when I was asked to um, speak tonight, you know, I, I, there was a bunch of different lectures that I you know, was considering giving, and I was thinking, here we are, we're ending, we're ending the year, we're ending 2020, we're ending uh, an amazingly challenging year on so many different levels. And instead of maybe talking about the challenges of 2020, let's think positively and look forward into 2021. And so what I wanted to talk tonight about is ways for us, we as physicians, to help maybe recreate our practices, um, redefine who we are, and start to really think about success on a multitude of layers, um, success on patient care, success on making sure that your team is engaged, uh, success that you're bringing home the kind of um, money that you want to, to provide for your family. Um, and it always starts with patient care uh, and it translates to these other things. So one of the things I like to talk about when I coach people, and, and I, do, I do quite a bit of coaching, but a lot of it is, investing in yourself and communicating um, effectively with people. So when I, when I titled this lecture, how to sell yourself to your patients and your staff, we are always selling. And I don't mean that as physicians. In life, we are always selling. People are always looking at us, judging us, and we are always selling who we are to somebody else. And so it, it's not about the actual financial sale, it's just you are promoting who you are. And so when I talk about this tonight, you think in terms of how am I projecting myself to others that they're going to buy what I am talking about. Um, and so that's what, I'm, that's what I'm talking about when I say how to sell yourself to your patients and staff. So do you ever, as, you know, as, as, as we get started, do you ever find yourself you know, challenged on getting patients to follow your, your treatment, that you recommend something, but your patients don't always decide to follow that course of treatment? Or do you have find your team not only is doing the things to you know, grow your practice, provide better patient care? Um, and so those are a couple of things that I want to talk about today that I've, I've really studied throughout the course of my, my life and my, my medical life and watching others who have done it really successfully and incorporate it into the things that I do. Um, so that's what I would like to talk about tonight. Um, I am the CEO of Wild Foot and Ankle Institute. Wild Foot and Ankle Institute uh, has 42 podiatrists in four states. Uh, we have 28 different clinics uh, in, in those four different states. And we have we have 240 plus employees. Uh, so I am always worrying about selling myself to our employees and the other doctors in our organization. Um, and I'm also the founder of Foot and Ankle Business Innovations. And Foot and Ankle Business Innovations is something um, that we founded in, uh, in 2013. And over the last seven or eight years, we've helped teach uh, other practitioners how to effectively run their practices more like businesses because we are all one way or another small business owners and by more effectively running our businesses so we can provide better patient care so we can um, do do better for our families and our employees um, and so that's what foot and ankle business innovations has done and I'll, and I'll maybe speak a little bit more to that over the course of, of the evening so when I think about this statement, you only have one chance to make a first impression. Um, that is kind of true, but I'm going to tell you that when it comes to our businesses, that isn't always the case. We have multiple chances to make a first impression. So let me talk about what those different points are that you need to be thinking about because the moment these things happen, you are selling yourself, you are selling your business to whomever is 
reaching out to you. So let's start with your phone call. That is truly your first chance to make first impression. So when somebody calls to make an appointment or find out about your practice, what is happening when that phone is being answered? Is the person on who is answering the phone on behalf of you and your business, are they effective? Do they, are they friendly? Can they answer all the questions? Do they do what the person who is calling wants them to do? Meaning, are they helping them make an appointment at the earliest and most opportune time for that person to come in to visit you to, so that you can help them get better? So think about how your telephone calls are answered. And I'm consistently surprised at how poorly people answer telephones. You know, when you call and the person is distracted or they don't even introduce themselves, doctor's office, they don't say who they are, who the doctor's office is. It's not warm and inviting. So if that is the first impression somebody is calling your office is getting, it's not a very positive impression. So what I would encourage you to consider is to dedicate somebody or multiple people, depending how big your, your business is, to do, do nothing but answer the telephone. And I would encourage you to script out what you want that, that call answering to look like. And you should be the one <clears throat> who scripts it out. And then you should role play with the, with the people who are answering the calls. And you should once in a while be a secret shopper and call the office from a phone number that they may not immediately know and hear what they say because you might be disappointedly surprised that the call and the way it's answered isn't giving the best first impression of your business. Another real important first impression is your website. How up to date is your website? So many doctors create a website and just kind of leave it there. They don't update it with current information, with current pictures. Um, there are pages that say coming soon, and that coming soon has been present for a year, which doesn't mean it's coming soon. It means that you didn't get around to doing the thing that you needed to do to make that website look better. Research will show that 78% of people will go on the internet before making a decision on what doctor to choose. They're visiting your website. They're visiting your reputation management, you know, like uh, Yelp and Google and things like that to see what your reputation is. And if your website doesn't look very good, they may be clicking off your website and looking for somebody else. So that is a really important first impression. When they first walk into your building and into your office, what are they seeing? Are they seeing dirt? Are they seeing torn carpeting? Are they seeing disrepair? Are they seeing things that are unimpressive? The moment they're walking into your building and the moment they're walking into your office, they are starting to judge you. So that is a really important first impression. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to put a fresh coat of paint on the walls or update the furniture in your waiting room. So think about, like, you should walk into other people's doctor's office. And when you go to your own doctor and say, what do you see? Or you should sit in your waiting room or other people's waiting room and just kind of look around. What is it that they're seeing? And if they're seeing things that you're not impressed with, then that's something that you should think about with that first impression. Another first impression, they approach the front desk for the first time. What happens at that front desk? Is that person welcoming, warm, smiling, welcome to our office? Thank you for coming today. How can I help you? Whatever it is that you want them to say with a smile on their face to be warm and inviting, you need to be thinking about that and maybe scripting it out as well. Remember, when people come into doctor's offices, they're scared. They don't know what's going to happen. And so if that first person at the front desk is a friendly face and a welcoming, inviting person, that can make a really positive first impression. Then, of course, they're sitting in the waiting room and your medical assistant brings them from the waiting room into the treatment room. Does your medical assistant welcome them? Do they in introduce themselves? 
Do they tell them, hey, Mrs. Jones, I'm Jim, and I'm going to take you back to get you ready to see Dr. Wild today. You know what we're going to do? We're going to start with some x-rays first because Dr. Wild wants to see the bones of your foot, and we want to move things along and streamline it, streamline it so the time you spend with Dr. Wild is well spent. So is that the conversation that people are getting with from the MA, or is it, Mrs. Jones, come with me? And they walk them down the hallway, stick them in a room, ask them a couple of questions, close the door. So every step of the way, you're having this opportunity to make a first impression. Then when they're left in the treatment room by themselves for five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever your standard timing is to leave them in a treatment room, what do they see? They are looking around the room. They're somewhat terrified because they don't know what's going to happen. And what do they see when they're sitting in your treatment room? Are they seeing dirty walls, disorganized counters, crap on the floor, dirt on the floor, whatever? But they are really, really judging you and your practice in those moments that they're sitting in your, in your treatment room waiting for you to walk in. And then you walk in. And that is your first chance to make a first impression for you to them. And that is where things really lie. So now that you've made your first impression, and I'll talk a little bit about that when you walk into the room. What if you what if you said that you walk into the room? Do you walk in with a smile on your face and positive energy? Um, look them in the eye and 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 introduce yourself the way I do it pre-COVID is I always like gathered myself no matter what was going on around me. I always I always gather myself before I walk into the room. I walk in with a smile on my face, real positive energy. I say, hi, I'm Lil Wild, and I introduce myself. Now, if you want to say your doctor, I always introduce myself as, hi, I'm Lil Wild, and I shake their hand. Today, I don't because of COVID. I don't shake hands anymore, but I still walk in, look them in the eye. I don't look at the computer first. I don't look at the x-rays first. I look them right in the eye to make that human contact right away and i introduce myself clearly so that they can hear that right away so now that i've established that contact with people let's talk about how to get them to to buy into what it is that you are saying first of all you need to believe in what you are saying conversion rate Research has shown conversion rate is 100% tied to your belief. And when I say your belief, if you are recommending a treatment, you have got to believe in it. And you've got to believe in it because you would recommend it to your family member or to your best friend or whomever it is. That's how convincing, that's how committed you need to be to whatever treatment that you are providing. And when you are telling people that what you believe, they're going to buy into it because they see the conviction that you have. So let me tell you a story. I can literally see this happening right now as I'm telling you the story. I was in practice, I don't know, the first two months of practice. And I walk into a treatment room and the, and the person had kind of early to mid-stage Halix limits, which I personally find to be one of the most challenging things we deal with. The gentleman was in his late 40s, and he was a chef, so he had to be on his feet. And believe me, I'm in practice just out of, just out of my residency and fellowship. And it's the first consultation I've had of somebody who had early to mid-stage Halix limits. And so I'm looking at his x-rays, I'm examining, and I'm going through my mind, you know, what do I offer this person? Because I don't think it's clear cut in this particular patient, what is the obvious thing to offer? So instead of thinking about what I'm gonna offer this guy, I literally verbalize all of the different options. We can get you into different shoes. We can make you orthotic. We could do a colectomy. We could do a decompression osteotomy. You know, if you want a permanent opportunity, we could do a fusion. And I'm literally talking like that. With, and at the end of it, I said, well, what do you think? And the guy looks at me with the biggest terror, terror eyes. 
and couldn't get, wait to get out of that room as fast as he possibly could because I didn't have any conviction. I didn't believe in what I was saying because I was just listening like you're going to a, uh, a, a restaurant and just picking off my menu. I didn't. I wasn't telling him what the best deal on, on the menu was. I was kind of saying, what do you think? I don't really know who you pick. Versus today, I'm always going to be super committed to my recommended treatment course. So, um, you know, I'll give you an example of something else. I, I use Shockwave quite a bit, and I've been using Shockwave for 20, almost 21 years. And so when I talk to somebody who's got chronic, it's called plantar fasciitis, chronic plantar fasciitis, I will very articulately talk about, they have plantar fasciitis. Here are the treatments that you've been through. They haven't worked. We can continue along the path for, you know, we can continue with orthotics, physical therapy, we can try another injection, whatever that may be. Or surgery is an option. You know, you've had this problem for six months. It hasn't responded to care. There's a surgical procedure that we can do that we bring into the operating room. We make a small incision. We release the plantar fascia. We get great results from it. Afterwards, you're in a bandage. You're off of work for a period of time. These are the results. Or we have this amazing non-invasive treatment. I've been doing it for 20 years. I've done it to thousands of patients. And what we do is you come into the office, we perform this procedure on you. It takes five to 10 minutes. It hurts a little bit while I'm performing it on you. But as soon as I'm done, it doesn't hurt. You put your shoes on, you walk out, you go back to work, you go back to life. We've got to do this three to four times over the course of a month or so. And at the end of the treatment, 90 plus percent of our patients are without pain. And yet insurance doesn't cover it. However, it only costs this amount of money, and you're not going to miss work. You, there are no complications, and the results are outstanding. And this is what I recommend for you. When I tell that story in that way, 95% of people don't really care how much I say the money is. Look, if it's an outlandish amount of money, of course, right? But when I provide that kind of belief and recommendation and i tell them other people who i've done it to and i will often give examples you know i had somebody just like you two months ago who had the same problem they had the same workout routine as you we did this they're already back to their workout routine people are going to believe what you are saying and i don't ever want you to say something that isn't true you should only say things with conviction that you believe are true because you would do it to your family or friends. But ultimately, that belief in what you're saying is hugely important in terms of selling yourself and selling your treatment to your patients. Back up what you say with experience and literature. Remember, in that treatment room, you are the authority and you need to be an authority when it comes to your recommended solutions and treatments. So. I, I kind of used it with the with the shockwave example, um, but I'm going to give it. I'm going to give you a couple other examples. But with the shockwave example, I said, "Hey, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've done this to thousands of patients." But now let me kind of take another angle when it comes um, to shockwave. I might say to somebody, um, and infrequently I will. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years, and there is a lot of evidence-based medicine that supports my personal experience. So if you look at the world of research and literature, it'll show that over 90% of patients who have this treatment are successfully treated with shockwave for plantar fasciitis in similar circumstances as you. And often I will pick a specific piece of literature that I will quote. And the reason I do that is one is you want to show that you are smart, that you're up to date on literature, that they can trust you because you are up to date on literature, and then you're gonna use your experience combined with literature to show your experience uh, when it comes uh, to that kind of, a, of conversation. Also realize Google is a wonderful and horrible place all wrapped up in the world. And people go out and do their own research. 
So you want to be more authoritative about what's going on in the world of current literature and research, and then, then they can go out and find on their own. If they find something that is more current or more real than what you can tell them, they may lose confidence in you. And so you want to provide, you're the doctor, you're the scientist, you want to make sure that you present yourself as such when you're giving your presentation to your patients. Be genuine. And I can't emphasize that enough. There are so many people who, when they give a presentation, it is, it, it is oily, it is greasy, it is not genuine at all. And people see through that so easily. So you want to be genuine with how you tell people what you believe. Um, look them in the eye. Be, don't be overwhelming. And, and try to you know, understand what kind of a person they are. If they're kind of an excitable person, you can be a little bit more excitable. If they're introverted, you may need to back off a little bit. But you want to be as genuine as you can when you are talking to people. I already talked about this, but I'm going to take this a, a step further. Make eye contact. So there's a few things that I would talk about when I, when I talk to you about making eye contact. There has been some research on this, but you want to put the patient in their chair at your eye level, okay? So you don't want to raise them up and you sit below them, nor do you want to stand taller than them and look down on them. And there's some psychological reasons for that. If you're standing, looking down at them, you are putting yourself in an intimidating position for them. And they may be intimidated by you and feel like you are overwhelming. If you sit below them, if their eye level is above yours, you may put your, yourself in a position of inferiority. And they may not have the same respect for you if you are sitting below them. So I always put people at my eye level. I stand all day long, so I always raise the chair and I'm looking at them eye to eye. Also, when I talk about making eye contact, how many doctors have you heard about or seen that walk into the room, turn and go to the computer and ask questions looking over their shoulder while typing in the computer? That is not a great way to establish a relationship and have you sell to them what they want, what they want to hear. So I am very deliberate about spending time looking people in the eye and having a conversation with them before I go to my computer and do the, uh, do the noting that we have, the charting that we have to do. Also, during my residency at the University of Pennsylvania, I had this unique opportunity that there was an orthopedic residency, but it was a DO orthopedic residency. And I learned a lot about osteopathic medicine when I rotated with some of these orthopedic DO residents. And there's a big philosophy in the world of DO of human contact, of touching with people. And so when I when they taught me about this, it really struck a chord with me, and I employ it every single day. But when I'm talking to somebody, I gently lay my hand on the top of their foot or their ankle when I'm telling them about their condition. Because there is body contact, there is there is electricity between humans. And when you lay your hand gently on their foot or their ankle in a way that is comforting, they are going to, they're going to be comforted by you and they're going to believe you to a greater degree. And I've had patients tell me that one of the reasons they chose me for surgery or even before surgery when I was telling them in the pre-op area how comforting it was to them that I just gently put my hand on. But those are some ways that you can really treat some interpersonal relationship with the eye contact and gently touching with people to get them to buy into who you are. Cover all bases. Make sure that when you're telling somebody about their problem, you're explaining it thoroughly, you're explaining it in layman's terms, and when you are done explaining it, there shouldn't be any good questions that people are going to ask. So, let me give you an example. When I give a bunion consultation, I go through the, so I'll go through my bunion consultation kind of quickly, maybe not to the full extent, but I'll tell people, you know, bunions, you have a bunion deformity. A bunion is the changing of a position of bones inside of your foot that is genetically inherited. 
most all bunions are genetically inherited. Even if we know you were going to get a bunion as a child, we couldn't have prevented it. So if we used orthotics or special shoes or braces, there was really no prevention from developing a bunion. So quick timeout, and I'm, I'm telling you, quick timeout. What I've done at that point is I've made them feel better. They didn't do anything wrong because they want to know that they didn't do anything wrong. So back to what I'm saying. So here's your x-ray. You can see the, the bunion and we can see the position of the bone has changed. And this is what's going on. And I, and I go in more detail. I said, at this point in time, your bunion has become obviously painful to you. We can see the x-ray changes. There are two things that you can do right now. One is you can continue to try to change your street gear, change your activities, and live with it as best as you can. Yeah, we can put orthotics inside your shoes, which may make it more comfortable, but it won't change the progression of the bunion. Or we can consider surgical intervention. When I do surgery, this is what I do. I describe how I cut the bone, how I move it, how I balance the tissue. I also go into what is the chance of recurrence. I don't let people ask it. I tell them. When I do surgery, this is my chance of recurrence, and this is how I've researched it, I've published it, this is the chance of recurrence. And then I tell them, it's an outpatient surgery, you come and go the same day, an anesthesiologist will put you to sleep, I will numb up your foot, I'll do the surgery, this is how long it's going to take. Afterwards, you're going to be the bandage in a surgical shoe for this period of time. It's not very painful, however, we provide medication for you. When you come back and see me at this day after surgery, we take your bandages off, we start physical therapy, we get you back in the gym shoes, you'll be able to start working out now in weight bearing one or two weeks after surgery, you'll be able to walk for exercise seven weeks after surgery, and I take them through every single step all the way through six months or more, so that when I am done, they don't have any questions, and I love it when people come with their sheets of paper and they kind of flip through their sheets of paper and they say, wow, you answered all of my questions. Well, what did that do? That just made them super impressed that I am very knowledgeable. I am very experienced. I have done this before, and I can anticipate everything that they may experience in the future, whether it's surgery or anything else. But that has made them believe in me as the person that they want to choose to go down a very scary path of surgery or anything else that we will be doing for them. This is one of the most important things that I can tell you. Listen. My mom's brother was a well-known um, physician, and he was the dean of two different medical schools throughout his career. And he and my cousins, his kids, all mostly became doctors. We became doctors, obviously. And he would tell us, and he's subsequently passed away, but he would tell us, you can basically diagnose 90 plus percent of anybody's problem by listening. And so I would encourage you to really spend a good amount of time listening to people and become a really good, active listener. Now, that doesn't mean you let people go on their 30-minute diatribe of all of the crazy stuff that may not be pertinent to what you need them to do. You can direct them through directed questions, but you want to listen to what they have to say. And if you can ask questions the right way and listen to their answers, you rarely need to look at an x-ray. You rarely need to touch their foot. You can pretty much make a diagnosis. Now, certainly we still have to go through a physical exam and look at the x-rays and whatnot. But listening is really important. And so I spend the time at the beginning of my meeting with the patient, looking them in the eye, listening to them with my hands gently on their feet, creating that connection. How do I prove to them that I have listened to them? Well, I dictate in front of every one of my patients. I use voice recognition, re recognition software, Dragon. And so when I am done, when I fi finish my physical exam, I dictate in front of them. What does that do? Well, it's, it makes me spend more time in the room with them and people have a perceived amount of time that you spend. So if you're gonna spend three to five minutes outside the room doing your notes, you might as well do it in the room. People are in their mind clocking you. But if they just told me their history, and then I dictate that history exactly how they said it in my HPI, that is amazingly powerful. They say, wow, this person listened to me. And that is a very positive, um, powerful connection that people want to know that their doctors listen to them. Close the, your appointment strong. So 
you, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to see you in three weeks. So I've told her when. And in three weeks, if you haven't gotten better, we're going to do this or this or this, whatever it's going to be. So that you're telling people, this is when I want to see you, you're clear, and this is what we're going to do. So it's not uncertain what the treatment is going to be like in the future. Because if you say, hey, I'll see you in three weeks. Well, they might say, I don't know what he's going to do in three weeks. Maybe I don't need to come back and see him. I didn't get better. Maybe he's got nothing else to offer me. So by you laying it out clearly in front of them, it's a very important connection um, to that patient. I would also tell you, you should make your appointments, your follow-up appointments in the treatment. Have your medical assistants do it in the treatment. Don't say, hey, stop at the front desk and make your appointment. People will walk right by the front desk. Or the front desk person won't really know exactly what the next appointment is for. And you might lose that patient to follow. So it's really, really important, to me, I think, to make that appointment in the treatment room before the patient leaves. And before I leave a treatment room, I always look at somebody and say, do you have any questions? And I always give them the opportunity to ask any questions. And so, you know, look, you're going to run into that once in a while patient who's going to take you down paths that you don't want to go to. But when you say to somebody, hey, did I answer all your questions for you today? It's a really positive ending to the meeting that you've had with the patient. Dress for success. Now, I, I have a certain belief on how doctors should dress, and that's not, this is how I believe. It's not how everybody should be. But your region, your geography, your climate, all make a difference in how you dress. But don't be sloppy. Your, your hair shouldn't be disheveled. If you're going to have facial hair, it should be well manicured. If, but your clothes shouldn't be wrinkled. I personally don't think you should have scrubs that look all wrinkled like you just got out of bed and you threw on whatever was in your hamper. Your, your, your lab coat, if you're wearing a lab coat, should be pressed and clean and not have stains on All of those things, people are judging you. And so the way I dress is I wear a sport coat and a, and a college shirt. And I have people say, look, I, I really appreciate that you that you dress nicely each and every time I see you. But I'm not telling you that that's the way you should dress. You should dress what's right for your region and geography, but dress for success. Don't just leave it haphazard and, and realize that people are judging you on those types of things. Connectivity. I believe strongly in the connectivity to my patients. I believe that I am here to serve my patients for their best outcomes. And as a result, and I know this might be nuts for some of you, I give out my email and my cell phone number to all of my patients. It is on my business card, my email and my cell phone. And I tell people, if you have questions, feel free to call me. For sure, my post not patients. I want them to be able to get in touch with me. They're going to get in touch with you one way or another. They're going to call your answering service, who's going to page you, who you're going to call your answering service, who's going to give you the message, and eventually, you're going to call the patient. So when I give out this connection to my patients, they feel like I am there for them, that I am a team. You know, we are partners. We are team members in getting them better. And so I always make myself available. And even when I'm on vacation, I'm not saying you should do this, but I take my own call. If I'm on vacation, people are still calling me. I'm not having somebody else take my call. I want to talk to my people. And so I have open communication with people and I encourage them to communicate with me. Because and I'm not just doing this to prevent malpractice, but if you look at why people sue doctors, they sue doctors because they don't think doctors care. Well, how could I not care when I give out my email, my cell phone, my hands, my calls, and I return my calls and all those kinds of things? I, I show that I care, and I truly do. And so I don't want to, to lie on somebody else's responsibility to take care of the patients who have trusted in me to help get them or their family members. Third-party endorsement. This is one of the most important things that you can do inside of your practice is get your medical assistants or your office staff to be your third-party endorser. And what does that mean? Those are people who say, oh, my goodness, you have picked the right doctor. We're so glad you're here. Dr. Weil is the best at heel pain. He is the best at bunion surgery. He is the best at. And when your staff tells people that, or when you consulted somebody for surgery and you 
and you leave the room. And then your medical assistant says, you know what, I've seen Dr. Lyle do this surgery so many times and he gets great outcomes. You're going to love the experience you have with Dr. Lyle. That's what third-party endorsements are. So when we turn on the television and we watch commercials and we see famous actors or athletes endorsing a product, that is a third-party endorsement. And so when you can have your team members, your trusted team members, tell your patients that they're in the right place, that they see the outcomes from you, that is a really resounding endorsement that people will buy into. So you want to find those, those team members that you really trust, and you want to teach them to say those key things, to say those key words. And you're going to start to see your consultations turning into scheduled cases or scheduled treatment or, or purchasing a second pair of orthotics or whatever that is that you're telling people that is going to be the best treatment for them. So now let me talk about selling yourself to your team. And that is as important as selling yourself to your patients. Because if your team member don't believe in you, it's going to come through. If they walk into a room and they don't have a lot of enthusiasm, or if they're bringing somebody back and, they don't, and the patient says to the, to the medical assistant, oh, you know, is Dr. Wild good at heel pain? And they go, eh, you know, yeah, he's fine. He's okay. And they walk out. Well, you've, you've kind of lost them before you've even gotten started. So you need to value your team. How do you value your team? People want to feel valued by their doctors, by their bosses. And all of you are kind of the bosses, if you will, of the people who work for you. Talk to your people. Get to know them. Spend a little bit of time at lunch before or after office hours or at a moment that you're not as busy and talk to people. Ask them about their weekend. Ask them about their family. Ask them about things that are important to them and show that interest. It goes a long way to people feeling that they're a part of your team and wanting to help you be successful. I have found giving my team members responsibility makes them feel valued. If your medical assistant is all they're doing is shuffling somebody from the, from the waiting area into the treatment room and then taking them out again, they don't feel very valuable part of the medical team. So I give my team members more and more responsibility when they demonstrate that they have the ability to do so. And I will spend time training them to get them to a higher level of responsibility. But for sure, people who are in medical practices, they want to feel a part of that patient care. And by giving them responsibility, they'll feel better about it, and they will represent your organization and you much, much better. Really importantly, compliment your team members in front of your patients. And so when your medical assistant comes in, you say, hey, my medical assistant, Jane, she's fantastic. She's been with me for three years. She knows everything that I need to do here. She's going to help you do this, this, and this. But when you have complimented her and said how great she is, first of all, it makes Jane feel great. It also makes your, your patient feel like, hey, this is a good person. He's he's." complimenting his team member in front of me, you know, that's a good person. But when you when you compliment your people, it's a really it's a really powerful thing. As opposed to, you know, saying in front of a patient, oh, Jane, you know, you didn't do this right. You didn't put this in the computer right. Or you brought me the wrong thing. That's the worst thing you can do. If you need to do some corrective coaching, do it away from a patient, not in front of a patient. So spend as much time in front of the patient making your medical assistants and your teammates feel good about who they are. I recently heard something that I think is quite brilliant. If you ask everybody on your team or other doctors in your organization the question, how do you want to be challenged? It's a really powerful question because somebody might say, you know what? I feel like you're giving me too much responsibility and I feel a bit overwhelmed. Or you might get somebody who says, you know what, I would love to do this and this and this for you, and I've never really been given the opportunity to do it. And you can learn a lot about your team but by asking them little questions like this. It'll make them feel good and it'll give you kind of a really good understanding of how you can incorporate them so that they can provide a higher level. And when your team can do things at a higher level, then you can provide care at a higher level. So you can be at the highest level of academics and training 
that you can provide for your patients. Um, the benefits of doing all the things that I just talked about is that patients will follow up on your treatments. You are in this to make your patients better. You are in this to get people better. But by doing all these things, people will then buy into the treatment that you have recommended, and it's going to get people better. You're going to get better outcomes, and patients are then going to like you. They're going to trust in you, and then they're going to tell other people about you. Because you're not just looking for happy patients who have had successful treatments. You're looking for loyal customers, loyal patients who are going to come back for their problem in the future and who are going to tell other people about you so that your practice continues to grow and grow and grow. And when you do all these things, your staff are going to, your staff is going to be happier. And ultimately, you're going to be happier because your patients are happier. They're getting better. Your staff is happier. And you're doing what you love to do. You're providing great care to people and you're providing great work environment for the people who work for you. So hopefully, as you kind of think about 2021, when you start to think about how am I going to start to set some new direction for me in 2021, these are some strategies that you can start to employ and start to you know, bring into place for you, your patients, and your team in 2021. If some of these things are interesting to you, you want more information, I'd encourage you to go to wildforfeet.com front slash partner with us. Uh, and there's more resources there uh, to help you through some of these things and other things. And I do a weekly uh, blog, vlog video that I send out every week to about 2,500 podiatrists. If you're not receiving my vlog every week, you can go to www.fabbyhub.com. Uh, and if you sign up, you can see all the historic uh, videos that I've done. I've done some of these things that I've talked about today and a whole lot more that can add uh, better ways to treat patients as well as ways for you to enhance the business of your, of your practice. Um, so I hope you enjoyed uh, this today. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, Ira and Mike, I'll turn it back over to you. And thanks for having me today. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Lowell. That was that was awesome. That was great. I think as you were talking about it, I was thinking about all these different things in practice after doing 30 years of it. And you, you, as Will Rogers said, you never get a, you don't get a second chance at a first impression. And, you know, like you're talking about the impressions you leave on your patients, <clears throat> stick with them. It's an imp, you know, it's, it's an imprint like with a duckling following the duckling, you know, the duck. You need to be a duck in the front where everybody, they want to follow you because they believe and trust in what you've told them. And if you don't believe and trust in what you told them, how can they? You know, it's interesting. You know, I don't remember where I got it from. And for all I know, it might have been a fortune cookie, but I carried something in my pocket. It was a little phrase that I tried to live by. Um, and it said, whether you spend 30 seconds or 30 minutes with a patient, it's how you make them feel in that time that makes the difference. And the reality is, Lowell, every, everything that you talked about here is how do we make people feel? I mean, I, I can tell you um, that, you know, growing up, you know, um, uh, as a young kid, my uh, my grandmother had a stroke when I was two years old. And this was before there were clot busters. And, you know, she was... Um, she became a hemiplegic, but anyway, she, um, mind was all there. And, you know, we go to the doctors and they were all dressed in, um, bow ties and starched coats, but they looked down on you. They didn't, they, they, you know, my grandfather was a lawyer. My mother was a school teacher. I mean, but they, you know, it, it's how you make these people feel. And I think that you hit on so many good points. Um, and you can't teach that to everybody. You have to, you have to inherently learn those skills somewhere. Yeah, I, I think so. And I had the fortunate opportunity to, to watch my dad do this stuff. And and my dad, everything that I talked about today, my dad was the absolute master. Um, nobody communicated with people better than my dad communicated with people. And so, you know, I learned a lot of my communication skills uh, that way. And, and I think if you can employ, like some of these things may not be comfortable for people, but if you can employ some of them, and adding to how you treat and talk to people, it'll go a really long way uh, to creating relationships. Hey, Lowell, you, may, you know, Ira brought up a point about taking the time. And I think a lot of people think that 
if you want to do the things you talked about <clears throat> with great detail and with great vigor, it takes you 45 minutes with a patient to do that. And can you just talk a little bit about that time management side of things, about being efficient in that message with, yeah. while still keeping yourself on schedule? Yeah, so thanks, Mike. And it's something that I really, really try to promote to the young doctors who join Wild Fund Ankle Institute or within our FAB and Mastermind program where we're coaching people. But time, using your time effectively doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of time. So I will see kind of typically in my day um, somewhere between 30 and 40 patients in a day. And often there are complicated surgical consultations and sometimes there's simple post ops. But I do all of my discussion, like I just talked about, and all of my charting in the room before I leave the room. So when I leave a room, I am completely done with my charting, my billing, and everything. But I think if you can be really good in your directed question and your focused exam and the way in which you're going to explain things to people in a very concise but detailed way, um, and people will often say to me, you really do a great job of explaining what my problem is. So it isn't like I'm flying through it. I love teaching people. And if you think of yourself as just a teacher in the room with people, and you're just teaching people about their problem. So I, I think that there is methods, and it takes some skill, because you can't always do it right out of the gate when you're a young practitioner. But it takes some skill to practice. But you can spend five to 10 really good minutes with people. And it can be a better five to 10 minutes than a 30 minute meandering, you know, pointless time with people. And I hear a lot of doctors say, oh, I like to spend 30 minutes with my patients. Well, I gotta tell you after five or 10 minutes, I got nothing else to talk to them about. And they have nothing else to talk to me about. We're done. And so I don't know what the next 20 minutes would be about. Um, so that, that's how I think of it. But I'm not sure I'm giving you like the exact, um, you know, recipe for success in that way. I just think it's some skills that you got to develop over time. No, no, agreed. Lowell, agreed. I, I, I know that, you know, we all have um, patients that are not ideal patients. They, 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 for whatever reason, the, the visit doesn't go well, whether they're not happy, whether they walked in not happy. You may never even seen them before. Um, how do you um, emotionally recover, you know, so that you can make your day get back on track? Because these are the type of patients that could throw off your whole schedule. You know, you might have had cases at lunchtime and now you're running late because you had this patient at 11 o'clock and it just was a nightmare. How do you, how do you regroup? How do you, what do you, what do you think about? Uh, well, I was terrible when I started practice. Because it was my job. If I had somebody that was unhappy with me or treatment or it was an emotionally exhausting, like I was buried. And now um, I just, I don't know. I think again, it's probably a, a learned skill, but you, you gotta kind of put it behind you as best as you can. Um, you know, the worst thing is on a busy Monday to start your week. If that first patient is a, is a nightmare, it can really derail you. But I tend to be a really optimist. If you can't tell, if you haven't ever met me, and I know both of you guys have, but some of you are on this lecture, I am always like this energetic and I'm always this enthusiastic. And so I just kind of try to move out of the room and try to like wash it clean and start afresh with the next person. Um, but every now and then it, it might carry over. And I've had some people say to me, gosh, you know, I haven't seen you for years. I haven't seen you kind of in this not as good a mood. And I'll be like, oh my God, Lola, you got to get yourself out of this. Come on, snap out of it. You can't be that way. And I tell people being a doctor is one of the hardest jobs in the world because we have a new encounter 30 times a day or whatever it may be. You know, if you're a business guy and you're having a bad day, you can shut your door, kick your heels up, and kind of say, book out my schedule for the day. We've got to do it five minutes later and five minutes later and five minutes later. So nobody's got it harder than us um, in terms of kind of shaking it off and going to the next person with that renewed energy and vigor and freshness. So um, it's hard, but you just kind of kind of have to kind of fight through it and keep, you know, keep Putting yourself in the mindset is, hey, the person on the other side of this door doesn't know what I just experienced. They're, they're expecting me to come in and be the best doctor I can possibly. They expect you to be game on every time you walk in the door. Yep. 
<clears throat> flawless game on as well. But <clears throat> of course, but so little. Um, how do you, you know, like you have you offered some unique services? I mean, let's cross from ESWT to EPAT to amniotics, whatever you want to do that that's that's unique to a a progressive current practice. Do you, how do you market those things? I know you discuss them well with the patients, but do you have flyers, brochures, televisions in waiting rooms? Do you have MAs that actually promote services? I know you talked about them, you know, feeling part of the team, which is really critical. And as you know, a lot of your, a lot of our patients trust the MAs greatly because they know them over time. They like them, right? So just curious about how you sort of internally market things like that. Yeah, I mean, we do a lot of different things. Like, first of all, our website, um, if you haven't gone to our website, I would say it's a great, it's a new website. We just put it out for for the last uh, two months. But we start to market right from our website. Uh, But we do a lot of social media and we do things like that. But once people get into our office, we do have televisions. And we actually have a dedicated video production and editing team who all they do is create unique video. And then we have a loop video that runs um, about a 30 or 40 minute loop video that talks about our doctors, our services, new technology, new services. And we change that video every 60 days or so. So when people come, they're gonna see something fresh. And so we're talking about that kind of stuff. We also have custom brochures that are specific to, like you said, amniotic, EPAC, um, heel pain, surgery, bunion surgery, this, that, and the other thing. And we have them that is customized and it's, it's presented really nicely on the wall. And, and, and I might, if I'm talking about it, pull out the brochure and hand it to people. But people will look at that. And of course, our, our medical assistants are talking about things too. So we're really trying to talk to people on a lot of different points of contact uh, to get them um, to those things. And then we're going to send, like we just sent out today, our de- our December newsletter to our patients. So we send out, you know, to the, the tens of thousands of patients who we have their email address. Every month we send out medical information, maybe general medical information, foot and ankle information, um, and some new things that we might be offering or specials that we're offering at our retail store. Those are the kinds of things because you want to constantly remind your patients about who you are, what you do. Because people want the practice is one that has a lot of new patients. And if you don't know the specific, you know, a healthy practice should have anywhere to about 10 to 20 percent should be new patients on. And if you're below 10 to 20 percent, and really you should be closer to 20 percent uh, in, in new patients on. If you're starting to go below that, you're not having as healthy of a practice as you should. Because as podiatrists, we're going to get people better. And so we need an influx of new pe- of new people. And so you really should be targeting your schedule of having 20%. And if you're not getting a 20%, you need to take a look at your marketing strategy. And you need to and, and you need to think of marketing not as an expense or a cost. It's an investment. You are investing in yourself and your practice. And, and you need to think of it in terms of that. So um, I know it kind of took a little bit of a tangent to your question, Mike. Oh, uh, it's excellent. It's, it's, it's excellent. Consideration. Well, I'm going to tell you what, Lowell, I'm going to end on a positive note. We've prided ourselves on ending on time, and it's uh, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying um, looking out at the mountain range here. And um, I, I, I just want to thank you, you know, for, for, for coming on and, and giving us some guidance and, and, and talking about different things. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a great way for me, like I said earlier to end the year. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I've had the opportunity to be, uh, with two friends, not, not just two strangers, you know, um, um, I've known you both for a long time. And, uh, I guess, um, you know, from, from Taylor medical to, uh, Everybody out there, we want to wish you a happy, um, you know, happy Hanukkah, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, um, whatever, whatever is going on during this holiday season. Um, we really want to wish you all a wonderful time with your families. Um, as Lowell said, let's look forward to 2021 and, and let's put 2020 behind us. Um, we survived. It's the end of the year. We've made it. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all again uh, January 5th. Um, when we're going to talk about using communication uh, tools to help strengthen and grow your practice. 
So anyway, um, Lowell, thank you very much. Mikey, it's always good to see you. Um, thank you, Lowell. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Happy New Year to everybody. And here's looking to a really strong 2021 for everybody. And, and looking to Taylor Medical to help you reduce those expenses so that you can have a stronger year in 2021. Thank you, Lowell. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Happy guys. Happy holidays. Bye.